Hello, and welcome to Extra. I'm Joanne Hines. And I'm Georgia Lash. Here at Extra, we bring you expanded coverage of recently broadcast features from Sun City News. Well, summer is here in Sun City, and the sun is out, and so are our residents. Okay, the fun is coming back. Now let's check out Mayfest, and you'll see what we mean. What's bringing everybody out to the Mayfest tonight? Let's find out. Things are getting pretty well back to normal now, and we're here at the Pavilion tonight at the Mayfest. Now, why exactly did you come tonight? We came because we love music, we love to dance, and there's food, and there's drinks. What more could you ask for, right? <laughs> and fun. Yeah, and fun, that's right. And meeting friends. <laughs> and I'm here at Mayfest in this gorgeous weather to be with my friends, have fun, and celebrate that we're all standing to be here. <laughs> it's good. Oh, uh, just to uh, be with friends because we've been locked in for a long time, so now we got some friends and some company and uh, just looking to relax and have a good time. And Dave, how about you? Uh, he took all my thunder. That's exactly what I was going to say. So I got some moonshine and picked it up in Tennessee uh, about two weeks ago and going to enjoy it. Uh, just the excitement of Mayfest. I mean, it's a beautiful evening. The music uh, is going to be wonderful. We're all looking forward to it. Oh, why wouldn't we celebrate May Day? And there's so many fun people here, too. Right. Oh, just a good time. A lot of music. A lot I'm of good dancer, friends. But I like watching. I'm a people watcher. <laughs> it's fun to do, too, isn't it? Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Thank you. The gentleman sitting behind me has asked us to come out. We love music, so we said yes. And it's a lot of fun. A lot it's of music. Got to be a lot of fun. The music. Some good music. Some good music. Yeah. Hopefully a show. I don't know. That's what they seem to say. Whether that's going to happen or not, I don't know. Yeah, these are wonderful guys. You'll enjoy them. One of the best things that we have here at Mayfest is that we all get together to see those that couldn't be able to come out because of the pandemic. And, 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 and as you can see, people are coming out, and that's making us feel much more wonderful and aware. Freedom. <laughs> Sunshine. Being out with the neighbors again. Music. It's just so wonderful to be out here. And Sun City does an excellent job. It really is. It's beautiful out here. I've been here almost nine years. This last year has been awful. But you guys did a great job. Oh, the beautiful weather, the people, and it's a great activity. And, I, and I've been locked up for a while with the pandemic and all that, so we're doing okay to get out here. What a wonderful group. Now, what exactly do you play? What type of music? And we try to take a journey through all of the uh, ages of music. We try to play a little bit of everything. Old stuff, new stuff, and everything in between. You taking requests? We take them. We don't fill them, but we take them all day long. We got a pad and we just write them down. Nice to see those Sun City smiles again. Georgia, let's keep this fun going. And what did you have stirred up for us? After so many COVID concrete cocktail <laughs> hours, we need some fresh ideas to shake up those taste buds. Lifestyles to the rescue, offering a mixology class. Reporter Chris Chase was there. Pickney Hall's buzzing tonight. We have a master mixologist with us. Now, what's going to be happening tonight? Tonight we're going to be doing a mixology class. We've got just over 20 people in the house. We're going to learn a little history about some of these awesome spirits we have in front of us. We're going to learn why they go together the way they do. And then we're, everybody's going to get the chance to make them themselves. So everybody's got their own little tools in front of them. We're going to build some awesome cocktails. We're going to have a blast. Well, Lindsay, it looks like Lifestyle Services has done it again. How did you get branded? I found Brandon last year and we did our first mixology class and I just had to bring him back. It was such a success. Now, how often will you be having him? 
It's gonna vary. Um, we're gonna try and do them at least twice a year, but right now I only have him scheduled today. I'm looking for something for the fall still. Yep, yeah, because he was saying he has brandy tastings and wine tastings, so he's got quite an array of things to do. He does, and we might grab him for another wine tasting that we have planned. Maybe a blind wine tasting sounds some, like some fun. <laughs> well, thanks, Lindsay. Thank you, enjoy, have a good time. Now, Patrice, what brings you here tonight? Well, my good friend, uh, had, her husband was in, is in the hospital today, and he had uh, surgery, so she asked me to come. And here you are. Here I am. Now, what are you looking forward to? Uh, learning how to do some of the mixed drinks, because my husband do doesn't want to bother with it. So I'm going to go home and teach him this week. I think you should make it for all your neighbors. Oh, definitely. Yes, yes. I think that's a really good idea. How about, what brought you here tonight? Oh. She did? Bernie brought me here tonight. Otherwise, you would never have come to this. Well, <laughs> you, you, one, people never stop learning. And you see, I'm, I've had a lot of years practicing to many more years than she has. How many years are you? 97, nine, yeah, 97. Everything you make today is going to go in one of these. This is going to be our mixing glass. Close, there it is. <laughs> Does anybody know how to make everything in the mixing glass instead of the tin? Is the tin though. So everybody got one of these, awesome. So we need to learn how to put these two together. So I recommend your tin go on the bottom, and then what we're gonna do is at a 45 degree angle, we're gonna put our mixing glass in. And in order to seal them, we wanna give them a nice pop. And if you did it right, yeah, all right, now, whenever we start shaking this guy, he's gonna build up some pressure, and he's gonna be a little bit harder to get off. So I'm going to show you guys how to safely and quickly get this guy off. What we want to do is right where we put it in at our 45 degree angle, that's where we want to put our palm. Right? And I'll put our other finger here and we're going to press away from that angle. So if you press on that angle, there's nowhere for it to go. It's not going to move. So we want to press away. I think I can master that class. Joanne, maybe you should stick to your newest interest, golf. You're the perfect person to introduce this next story for our Low Country golfers. Thank you. We've already enjoyed the RBC heritage, but due to a necessary adjustment in this year's PGA calendar, the Low Country will benefit from a second PGA tournament. Sports reporter Doug Wright was at Media Day to get the upcoming details on the Palmetto championship at Congaree. Well, we are standing in front of the main house at Congaree Golf Club here in Ridgeland, South Carolina. The end of a media day where we spoke with Ty Vota, who is the executive director of the PGA Tour, and many other dignitaries, including pro golfer Lucas Glover, at a beautiful setting and a wonderful golf course. A very exciting time for South Carolina, as noted by Dwayne Parrish regarding the impact on the golf industry and tourism in general in South Carolina. We're glad to be a part of it today, and we look forward to the tournament on June, the week of June 7th through June 13th. I'd like to introduce the five people who are here today. Ty Bota is the Executive Vice President of the PGA Tour. Good to have you here, Ty. Dwayne Parrish, who is the Director of Parks, Recreation, and Tourism in the state of South Carolina. John McNeely is the Managing Director of the Congaree Golf Club. Bruce Davidson is the Director of Golf of the Friedkin Group. And Lucas Glover, a three-time winner on the PGA Tour, Clemson graduate, and the 2009 U.S. Open champion. It's great to have all of you all here. And so the Congaree Foundation is the heartbeat of this club. And since inception, uh, we have over 200 ambassadors now. 
the generosity of those ambassadors financially to the foundation and the impact that they make to the kids by giving of their time as mentors has really allowed us to create a model which I think in the world today is unique. We have our signature program which we call Congre Global Golf Initiative and we're basically providing access to golf and to collegiate education to children around the world, most of whom are financially underserved, many of whom are underprivileged, and quite a percentage of them have actually, or when they go to college, will be the first person in their family to attend university. Well, I'm here with uh, Dwayne Parrish, uh, and uh, tell us what your position is. I'm director of South Carolina Parks, Recreation and Tourism. And how did you uh, get wind of this, and how did you get uh, the state involved? Well, we got wind of this early on, just through, uh, through just through the golf world, if you will. But you know, the, the folks at the PGA Tour and the folks at Congaree brought it to the governor's office and myself, and we sort of looked at it, what the benefits were in regard to advertising, in regard to social media, and the sort of broad economic impact we could have, and really make a difference in golf. And we said, yes, we'll do this. We want to be the title sponsor. And so we became the Palmetto Championship, um, but, the folk, but we could not have done it without the PGA Tour and without the, the, the uh, folks here at Congaree. And what a wonderful story they have to tell. And you did it. Like uh, today is uh, the 1st of May, basically, and uh, the Canadian Open was canceled just two months ago. How'd you work that miracle? That's right. Yeah, I, I didn't know you could do a golf tournament in 90 days, but now I'm seeing it done right before my own, my own eyes. But yes, they came to us about two and a half, about two months ago, and um, during that time. We knew we had to make a decision quickly. We did. Um, for, fortunately, the legislature and everyone else was on board with the governor's office as well, able to make this happen. And it's a once in a lifetime opportunity for South Carolina to be able to do this. I mean, to be on television, nationally broadcast, three months in a row on a major PGA Tour event is just a, our PGA of America or PGA Tour event is phenomenal for us. And so we, we said, look, we'd be crazy not to do this. Well, if people don't know about South Carolina's golf opportunities, they certainly will this year. And that's what we're hoping. That's what the goal of all this is. We've always been known for beaches and golf. We just want to put that on steroids and make sure everybody's aware, particularly at a time when golf is on the rise. We want people to come play in South Carolina when they take that golf trip. Well, I think they will. And I uh, appreciate your time today, and congratulations. I think it's going to be a great affair. I believe you're right. Thank you very much. So, Mr. Vota, it's good to see you here in South Carolina. And uh, Tell me, uh, this has been referred to as a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, but uh, you've been in contact with Congre before this year, and uh, tell me about that history a little bit. Well, uh, I first set foot on, on uh, Congaree's grounds uh, in January of 19, okay. and that established a, 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 and I was, the minute I stepped foot, I knew it was a special place, and, uh, and it created a dialogue, it started a dialogue with the ownership and the leadership here at Congre about ways in which we could do more things together. Uh, and the philanthropic mission of Congre appealed to us in a great way because we, we at the PGA Tour uh, also have a philanthropic mission to raising monies for charities in the communities in which we play, uh, mm -hmm. leaving them hopefully better than when we, we found them. And the fact that we've been able to contribute over $3 billion to 3,000 charities around the world uh, over the last 50 years is something we're very proud of and we're proud to associate ourselves with people like-minded people like the folks at Congaree. So it was a it was a great fit. Yeah, that's a, that's a big number, a very big number and uh, you must be very proud of that. Uh, the, and it's also been mentioned that maybe uh, this place might be on a, some kind of list that you guys keep uh, in the back of your minds for uh, other tournaments, majors or President's Cup or things like that? I think uh, w what we're focused on is is making this the best event it can possibly be. We have no doubt that, it, that it's going to perform very well. Our players are going to uh, be very complimentary of it. And uh, what future opportunities ar arise, a lot of different ingredients go into sure. bringing, a, bringing a, a, a tournament to a particular community, uh, date, uh, w sponsorship, uh, what the what the timing looks like on on you know where we are the week before the the, the, the the location and where we are afterwards all of those things come into play uh, and and w we're fortunate to have a full schedule fully sponsored schedule uh, on the PGA tour and as as opportunities and special events uh, come forward 
uh, Congaree is going to hold a special place for us, and we're going to certainly be uh, in discussions about future opportunities. Well, that sounds great, and thank you for your time today. Uh, it's a real short time to put it together, but you guys seem to be doing it quite well. Well, thank you. Uh, I know everybody's going to work really hard over the next several weeks to get it done. All right. What a chance to see some prominent golfers practically in our backyard. Yeah. And even closer to home, Georgia, you had a chance to meet some prominent authors. Thanks to Book Club 5, who worked through the pandemic guidelines to bring their annual book forum to Pinckney Hall. The forum's four stellar authors took time with me to share how they shaped their stories. Dr. Fox, please tell our viewers what the Book Club Forum is all about. Well, we're all avid readers. Chapter 5 is the African American experience, but we read all types of books. And I thought that if we brought in local authors, it'd give our, an opportunity to showcase them, and that's what we're doing today. It's a privilege, and I think we ought to tell everybody this is what you're missing if you're not here. <laughs> Mayor Kaiserling, I've read that in your book, Sharing Common Ground, that it's important for us to discover some buried American history. With that being said, who's your target audience for this book? Well, our target audience, I think, are the leaders of tomorrow. Adults have not done a very good job about talking how we haven't fulfilled the promises of freedom, justice, equality, and opportunity. And we've sort of gotten into a routine. So parents who are third generation who've never been taught this history have brought their children up so they just live in the same way. But the middle school student, 8, 9, 10, up, even up to 15 into high school, <clears throat> their minds are like sponges. We give them a piece of primary resources and say, here's so-and-so rivers. And he was a slave who escaped and went and joined the Union Army. <clears throat> so we begin, and then we send them out with video skills, visual art skills, writing skills, and say, go tell the world about Mr. Rivers. And so <clears throat> we begin to bring the history that the scholars write about, public, public television broadcast. <clears throat> um, museums exhibit, but we take it to the vernacular to the real people. And the goal is, is these are the world changers. These young people today, they're ready to go, they're very curious, and if we find something that is of particular interest, they will go at it ferociously, and they will create and be writing the history that we've never been told that will accompany what comes with it. Wanda, your books your writing humorously addresses the topic of the Golden Agers world. Now you're a Sun City resident, so tell me, have you gotten any of your ideas from our neighbors? <laughs> oh, well, absolutely. In fact, the very first essay I wrote that uh, created any attention to me was one called A Bag Lady and then in parens of sorts. So I became a bag lady after I moved to Sun City because I was participating in all of these activities. I thought they were fabulous. So I had all my activities lined up. I had them all divided into bags and lined up at the door like this so I could grab the right one when I went out. And uh, it was just, it was really quite hysterical. So anyway, that is certainly one. I have ta I took ballet lessons, never having had on toe shoes, I mean not toe shoes, but ballet shoes at all, and wrote a poem about that which was really really funny and then I also <laughs> wrote a poem I mean a, an article about my ballet class doing the maypole and rainbow of rhythm, rhythm once and we got all tangled up so it was really it was really really funny um, other examples you can just look around and see people that are grand that have grandchildren I have grandchildren grandchildren are a source of many many laughs and um, also, one that is my favorite is we all kind of look alike, and we all have kind of the same, <laughs> the same concerns and the same issues. So when I noticed that I was breaking out in spots, which I didn't want, 
I wrote a uh, poem about spots on me. And the, and the person in the poem runs to her esthetician, and the poor person can't help her. She runs to the doctor, and the doctor can't help her. So it's pretty funny. <laughs> now, all these laughing lessons that we're getting from Wrinkles in Paradise and more Wrinkles in Paradise, what's the takeaway or what you'd love for us to learn about aging from your books? What I'd like people to realize is that there still is a great zest in life. It doesn't really matter how old you are. It's how you look at things. And when, since I've been in Sun City and before, I could find funny things in almost everything that happened, even routine kind of things. And so that's really what I want people to um, understand and take away. Also, I wasn't really writing, particularly in this vein, until I came to Sun City. So it was a brand new endeavor for me, and I think that those kinds of things last and are available here in Sun City. Try something new that you've never done and just see how it develops. Notes from 1619 is a remembrance of the first Africans arriving in America 400 years ago. What were your writing challenges to take on this expansive history? Well, I wanted to uh, remind white readers of a lot of the uh, challenges that's been placed in the, in the, in the, in the way of uh, black Americans um, from the very beginning, from slavery to uh, reconstruction to the redlining, uh, uh, to the uh, in, in unfair applications of the GI Bill, uh, uh, and to remind white folks that, that these are some of the impediments that hold black people down, and, and they shouldn't avoid knowing about it, and so it's all in this book. Right, and in the research I've done about the book, it says that you know, you've know you written these beautiful poems that actually in the book chronologically mirror the African-American experience. Which of those experiences really talked to you, spoke to you about what was going on? Well, lots of it, especially um, um, uh, especially the endurance, the endurance of, um, of slaves. You know, to, 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 to emerge from such a horrible thing with, with hope uh, is inspiring. Cynthia, congratulations on your newest book. What is the premise of the book? Thank you. Well, my A Good Case is about two African-American caregivers working in Beverly Hills. So that's a mouthful, right? The critics compare my book to the movie To Help. So, you know, how did you do, how did they do a story about two maids? The, the, it's the story of the actual worker. So the caregiver finally has a voice of what it's like to actually uh, work for seniors. And, and, you know, caregiving, you work for other uh, young adults and uh, all ages, but it's mainly in the senior, senior care. So, um, the story takes place about a young lady in search of work. It takes from the, it starts opens in uh, Philadelphia from Bucks County and journeys into Los Angeles. So it touches a lot of people because she literally is crossing country with different experiences and she befriends a young lady named Gladys Crenshaw, the main character Sheila Price, and I use the word Sheila Price on purpose. She meets a lady named um, Gladys Crenshaw and they become good friends while working a case in Beverly Hills. True story. So, you know, and so as I was writing this, and there's so many ins and outs to caregiving, I said, you know what? Before I was writing this, I thought, there's a story here. Because so many people can relate to a good case. You know, nurses, caregivers, doctors, a lot of people in the, in the care, CNAs know what a good case means. Well, and here we are in Sun City, so certainly something for us always on our mind. Now, you have been a caregiver, mm -hmm. perhaps not recently, but I thought as you also were working on the foundation of the book, what did you learn about the state of caregiving in America? Okay, so it is a multi-billion dollar business. It's not a million, it's a billion dollar business. And, and it's fortunately and unfortunately that a lot of seniors will have to spend their life savings on caring for themselves. And perhaps that's why they saved it, which is great. It's the key is that the money is properly allocated to their care and not them being used as just a business. It is a business. We can't get around that. It is now a huge business. Um, the key, the reason I wrote it, because people have a lot of questions about caregiving. Do they find the right person? How do I find the right person? It, it's all answered in the book through a series of events. I don't 
push the reader. It's it's actual events. You can come to your own conclusion. You know, um, a senior to me should be able to stay in their home if they choose, if if the, if at all possible. That's why I love being here in Sun City. You see the lifestyle. It keeps you. People want to live, and they want to be active, and and you're not alone. So a good case just answers all the questions about how to get a caregiver. You know we are more relatable through our experiences. So there's a lot of uh, similarities in what family members face, what the agency faces, you know, uh, what the caregiver faces. There's a lot of components. And I tell a really funny story. You laugh, you cry. It's serious in some areas, but you can, it's very relatable. And people love it. And um, I'm very pleased with the outcome. Well, that's extra for June. I'm Joanne Hines. Please check out the program guide in Sensations and the Sun City website for our other SCTV monthly shows. And I'm Georgia Lash. Thank you for watching. Please join us again next month as we bring you extra coverage of stories and features from Sun City News.